existing in that community. Uh, when we had a president who basically said we wanted to address and alleviate or eliminate poverty in the United States, we began to brainstorm ways of addressing this complex issue of that time. And one of the things that was discussed, and I wish uh, Chino Garcia was here or a couple of folks like that because they were part of this discussion, is a group emerged in the Lower East Side called the Real Great Society, as opposed to President Johnson, who succeeded Kennedy after he was assassinated. And there were lots of discussions, and one of them was about a guaranteed second income, how you would create a different way of distributing the resources of of our society. Yeah. Part of the element even behind setting up Restoration Corporation was that every resident of that side would own a share in this new community-owned corporation. Mm -hmm. Kennedy, while he was alive, uh, brought in people from various different think tanks around the country of how do we really form this community-owned entity that would deal with comprehensive development. I think we need to somehow go back to that kind of nurturing and think about how we connect all of these issues of work to sustainability to mitigation issues because uh, somehow the issue of infrastructure is one that has to transcend any private corporation. It's not, it's not the Uber that allows individuals to get together in a, a, a singly owned car. It maybe is a way of developing a, an Uber model but creates a cooperative car that comes along that we all share and we all get into. Right. Uh, so somehow we've got to break away from this way of thinking and, and start thinking, what are the new ways and the new economy, which is something that I think we're addressing, that can address climate change, that can deal with the issues of you know, economic justice and social justice and environmental justice because all of these converge. And, and the real struggle in looking ahead is how do we take the agenda that you're going to present on Tuesday and really take that to the next step of really beginning to get a mass to support it. Can you talk a little bit more about the follow-up to the press conference and things of that nature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the agenda is, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully sort of lay out a little bit of like potential areas of engagement. Because besides just really just recommending, I think that it's, it's also sort of suggesting uh, spaces for engagement uh, at different levels uh, and in terms of different issues where some of them, you know, there are interconnections, but, uh, but in some cases there's very specific issues. The idea is really to, to, to sort of begin to uh, fill in some of the gaps that the one NYC plan hasn't filled yet, um, with by highlighting some of the community-based initiatives that are already being successful in, for example, using green infrastructure to reduce uh, potential flooding or storm surge impacts, to increase permeability, uh, but at the same time use vegetation to control winds and, uh, and serve as uh, barriers to air quality uh, uh, stressors. In addition to that, sort of how do you, will you connect that along the waterfront, can also improve mobility, create an evacuation infrastructure, those types of things. Um, but in addition to capital projects that a lot of these communities have, uh, in many cases already, and you have already in the pipeline, what are the type of policy recommendations that can bring equity um, back or, or further, sort of, uh, or improve the way in which really the, the city's initiatives or the city's framework is thinking about it. Challenging, well, first recognizing the achievements, because I think that this administration has to be commended in many ways, but also talking about shortcomings in the in, in the light of you know how to meet, bring together, work together, civil society, government, and I wanted to highlight you know really sort of uh, the work that AIA has been doing, uh, both in terms of this administration and the previous administration has been, has been really important because it has really crystallized the role of the private sector, uh, architects and engineers, but also real estate uh, developers in, in, in figuring this out together. So hopefully the agenda is going to be a combination of, uh, of uh, uh, both sort of like highlighting strengths and achievements, opportunities, um, and then recommendations really on, on, on how to work together to really 
continue redefining equity in the context of uh, sustainability and resiliency, but really interjecting with the need to talk about justice, because it's 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 really sort of like uh, it's, it's only until the point that we describe environmental justice and climate justice and how it can happen that we really sort of get to the roots of the organization. Any questions? I'm just going to add a comment real quick. Um, I'm actually writing on the city regional planning and threat. Uh, one of the things that um, I have seen that's kind of been missed a lot in the, the past three uh, lectures is the indirect effects of climate change. Uh, what happens to the family that can't feed their kids? What, because of a drought or whatever it may be, what happens to those kids when they grow up and political violence and all of that? So I just wanted to throw that in there for a second and, and reiterate how climate justice is a social I can talk about it. I can talk about it. I can say that, um, and, and actually it was discussed, I think that Elizabeth Yamp here, um, in, in, in spite of our question that she got from the audience, um, it, I think it engaged in, in an interesting conversation about, which is something that the Maris Reyes has also been kind of, they also point, pointed out here in, in a different uh, lecture, circular round or circle, circle, which was the fact that really sort of like how big of a challenge we have right now where all of these infrastructure building improvements can fuel gentrification. Like how do we sort of deal with the indirect effects not only of climate change impacts but of mitigating and adapting, adapting to climate change impacts where, where there isn't really sort of a real framework right now to make sure that, that besides sort of the, the innovative ventures that we were all talking about in terms of the cooperative approaches to thinking and owning and managing the infrastructure, real commitments and provisions that they won't there won't be displacement in the communities once they improve their um, you know wastewater infrastructure as as Jamie was pointing out, the energy system or its coastal protection. And and then I think that that's it's it's really problematic because um, a lot of the communities are experiencing that in real time. Mm -hmm. The Lower East Side is one uh, but also Hunts Point, uh, in and around sort of the, the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. Part of it, and, and what, I can, what I can say is that what I know the NIJA members are doing in that regard is thinking about, is working with labor and really making sure that the policy discussions and, these, the, and, and negotiations happen, both environmental justice and labor groups are sitting at the table. So at the very least, both the needs, the capacity, and the priorities of the residents of these areas and the workers that depend on those jobs um, can actually sort of benefit from it. Otherwise, if we just focus, for example, on, on the environmental justice side for a second, on the types of regulations that we require to make sure that these neighborhoods improve their sustainability and their resiliency, chances are that a lot of the local industrial businesses that operate there who work with little, very little and very tight margins won't be able afford that because a lot of these investments as we were discussing will never have an economic return yet as I agree with you have a really important economic or should be economic and, and, and environmental um, priorities. Your question is also the bandwidth question yes. uh, because you know it, it, it's really critical uh, uh, Colvin and I had this discussion about the large-scale displacement that is now taking place in Bedford Stuyvesant uh, what happens if you, and Adam was here earlier, works in, uh, in the Rockaways, what happens if we have to retreat from the Rockaways yeah. uh, with all the public housing? Where will the folks from that area move to? Uh, they won't be able to move to the bed size or the Brownsville's or other places that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, what happens is that it, it, it will make areas like bedford Sides, even though it's in that heat pocket, even more desirable. And so the competition for that space becomes even greater. It, it, I think it really gets to the issue that we have to somehow address this and open up this dialogue and the, the debate right away and can't defer it 20 to 30 years from now. Because, you know, a couple of months ago, one could have argued that it will be 100 years from now, according to the New York Times, it may be 20 years from yes. now. So that means if you want something built, it's got to be planned yesterday. Yeah. It can't be planned 
you know, uh, the day after tomorrow. So yeah. these are really hard issues. Uh, they're hard issues, but they're challenges as well. Uh, and they're opportunities that can come out of it as long as we can awaken the political establishment to address it. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm hoping for, and I'll call on you, Brent, in a second, is that, you know, we've got a limited opportunity in New York for the next two weeks where we might be able to get one of the presidential candidates to answer these questions. Yeah. And whatever opportunity, you know, call Brian Mara. He may be uh, moderating a debate. Ask him to ask this question. Ask him to ask the question of low-income housing. Forget affordability, because that's a bullshit term. And really, how are we really going to address the needs for low-income housing in every community of the city of New York, not only in communities that now have low populations? We should be talking about integrating you know, Manhattan and Park Slope and other areas before we start talking about integrating East New York and other places. It really has to be part of the agenda. Well, I just want to add some footnotes, pragmatically, as an architect and who has been teaching energy conscious design for 43 years now. Uh, first of all, look at what happened with bicycles, just overnight. That happened. If, uh, in terms of, even though 80% of construction elsewhere uh, doesn't involve architects, any person, a low or a medium or a high income, that does anything without an architect and filing with the building department, the minimum fee just about now is $2,500. So the building departments are packed with applications. The examiners are enforcing five different energy codes. You get to pick which energy code you're going to send in your calculations. In Queens, if you don't uh, show how you're solving the runoff water by doing a sump pump or some way of entraining the stormwater into your rear yard, you don't pass. You get punished or you get violations. So there's all kinds of pragmatic stuff. Uh, in the Albanian community, which I deal with a lot, they do probably 80% of the roofing. Almost all of them now put white roofs on instead of black tar roofs. They talk their, their clients into doing a white roof that reflects heat. Uh, before, one of the problems I worry about is the solar energy ads that we all get almost hourly. Because if you give up your roof to let someone else come in and do solar collectors, then you you're not getting that advantage, that, that company. So I think that's an area that needs to be worked on. I also think that high school kids, instead of maybe a lot of them selling drugs, why can't we have courses in high school of how to insulate a building or to do sheetrock or something? I don't know, except for a few technical high schools in New York City, we don't have anything like that to help people, particularly younger teenagers, to learn how to do anything. And then there's no job market for them because if, if they were being trained, there would be emerging groups of people say, hey, we want jobs. And there would be people that tap into that and hire them to do things. So there's a lot of pragmatic things that are going on successfully, I think, uh, that we need to expand and, and enhance. Okay. Uh, it's 8 o'clock, I think, a little bit after. Thank everybody for coming. But before we break up, I'd just like to ask Jamie and Juan to make a closing comment. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I mean, I actually wanted to hear from you a closing comment because this is I'll the end of your lecture series. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I will say that uh, I think the real big takeaways here are I think we're all sort of thinking about this. I love the idea of the disturbance. You know, like we're in that moment now. We're challenging the status quo. Is really at you know, we are now at this point, and I'm speaking to the, the young uh, professionals in the room or to become professionals, you know, that this is a time uh, in your career where you can really begin to question the ways that we value our investments, that we do benefit cost analysis, that we, you know, value our environmental resources. Uh, and I think that that gives me, you know, when the doom and gloom sets in, that type of stuff you know, gives me a lot of hope. So, good luck. Uh, thanks, uh, Ron, for inviting me along. Um, it's always good to sit on the panel table. You know, both of you guys for quite some time. Um, you know, my, my, my takeaway from, from this is that um, there's a lot of committed people to this. And what I said at the beginning of, of my lecture is that it's like shaking the bed to wake people up. If you rewind this before Sandy, courses like this didn't exist. 
the training of architects to understand what resilience is, mitigation, adaptation, talking viscerally about energy code requirements, that didn't exist. It didn't exist. So in this short amount of time, that change has happened, and that's why I say at the beginning of it. Uh, where do the 200,000 people go that will be displaced, will be displaced in the next couple of decades from our coastal line, coastline in all of these neighborhoods that we're discussing? They will be displaced. How do we up zone? How do we change all the infrastructure patterns, living patterns? What is the loss of value to all that property? And the equity that will be lost in those communities if they do own the property because no one's going to buy it. So the problems that we have are, are enormous, but how can you make a difference? I think these classes and how you decide to be part of the solution, making the change, being part of the disturbance on your end, is where we need to go. And that's why I'm very encouraged by these discussions. I'm encouraged that, that my colleagues at the AIA, that, 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 that uh, my colleagues like Juan and everybody are really working hard at this and taking action, not just writing the paper, but actually doing something about it. It's getting our hands here getting out there, building the buildings, or, or working the communities, and retraining people. That, to me, is, is the action part. I've seen so many writing, 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 and it's just satisfying to see people getting out and actually doing, 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 doing. That's why I take a look. So I have two, two comments, and, and they're both for the students. Um, I think that you know, you th we talked about how all of us really have been inspired by you know, the thinking that took place a couple decades ago, and, 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 and all of it, all of the, the different um, uh, benefits that that triggered. Uh, to highlight two things, one is this is a time where, regardless of whether you're interested in energy or transportation or housing, or you need to figure out what are the principles that that you guys are going to sort of adopt or, or, or develop. And, and what is it that's going to guide the type of decisions that you're going to be making when you begin working professionally? Because that's really what matters. Uh, I think that you've heard a couple different uh, perspectives on some of these issues, but, but what determines the type of planner or designer or professional that you are are the principles that you decide you're going to adopt. And then the other thing that I wanted to say, both kind of like going back to the innovative, the type of innovation really that happened back then and that is sort of still so relevant today is, is a sort of a plug for the need for good research. And, 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 and that's kind of like required. I mean, I think Ilya talked a lot about the type of research that is, that is taking place right now in defining and evaluating the types of technologies that will be required, but the impacts, the direct and indirect impacts of those technologies and those investments are going to require genuine research approaches and, and new ways of asking those questions. And so I kind of like just want to emphasize how important it is for you guys to really sort of assume that challenge. Well, I, I think, you know, the idea of research is critically important. But taking research and linking it to the design process is really critical. The difference between planners and designers, as opposed to pure sociological researchers, are that you seek a solution to the problem that you're trying to address. And so the design process really looks at a whole range of different alternatives that allow you to solve those problems based on the foundation of knowledge, and that's where the research comes in. And I think research plus a design process plus a value system if they, you bring them all together, will lead to various different kinds of solutions that we need to uh, accumulate and to begin to launch. Whether they're the detailed pieces that Brent was talking about in terms of how you uh, paint a roof white, or whether it's a much more global kind of intervention uh, that is needed to really solve a particular problem, maybe a, a community-owned utility or some other kind of vehicle to achieve those goals. I, I think one has to do both. It's just not a matter of, yeah. we, we need to create the ability within our own selves to think about what, more than one issue at one time. We have to be able to become those people who weave the various different strands together to create the cloth. Because we can't just look at just one strand of that intricate fabric that is really the 
the end of the solutions, that, you know, is part of the solutions that we need to achieve. So what we've begun talking about today, I guess there really isn't a, a fixed agenda, is that there's a challenge that you all have, and particularly your generation of planners and architects and, and civic leaders, and that is to basically tackle this issue and not let anybody get away with avoiding the fact that this is something that's real and that we can't defer to the next generation to solve. Because, you know, it's going to affect your kids, it's affecting my grandkids uh, in a way that will be fundamentally change the lifestyle and the configuration of our cities. And, our, and, 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 and we can't just sit back idly. It's also a point for great creativity and for those crazy ideas. Uh, some of them will fall to the wayside, but some of them really could take root. And I think I really try to encourage you all to take this on, not only as a very serious endeavor, but really as an enormous opportunity. And I want to thank you all for coming and staying so late on a beautiful day, uh, which will be followed by, I think, a wintry day. Yeah. Enjoy the moment. <laughs> Snow is coming.